This program on American art, culture, and society is made possible by a generous gift from Anne Burnett Tandy. Currently at the Amon Carter, we are celebrating the work of folk artists in our exhibition, Self-Taught Genius, Treasures from the American Folk Art Museum, which is upstairs, and Texas Folk Art, which is in one of the main galleries in the front of the building. Romantic philosophers believe that within folk arts lay the spirit and the soul, the genius, indeed the unity of a people. The artworks on view in our exhibitions reflect the fact that the country's earliest folk artists often worked together as a community. For example, creating quilts or intended their work, whether it was advertising signs, furniture, weather vanes, fractures, for a social context. Above all else, folk artists strove to express a connection to their community and a commitment to its values. Since the 1990s, Rick Lowe has revealed how community and social context can be art forms. Originally trained as a painter at Texas Southern University in Houston, Lowe shifted his artistic practice in the early 1990s in order to address more directly the pressing social, economic, and cultural needs of his community. Inspired by the German artist Joseph Beuys, who once described the enlarged conception of art to include every human action, Lowe realized that art can be the way people live. He began to re redefine his work in these terms beginning in 1993, when he took over nearly two dozen derelict shotgun houses in Houston's Third Ward and, over the course of 20 years, turned them into a thriving cultural center that offers exhibitions, artist residencies, and even a program for single mothers. Project Row Houses has since become an important symbol of the way a neighborhood can be transformed for the better without obliterating its roots. Instead of allowing the history of the area to be erased, Lowe created a place that nurtures a sense of togetherness and exchange. This visionary art project continues to evolve today. More recently, in his role as the first artist in residence at the Nasher Sculpture Center in Dallas, wrote, trans, has transformed one of the most densely populated immigrant communities in Dallas, known as Vickery Meadow. This project, entitled Translation, features a series of workshops, three freestanding white cube gallery spaces for exhibitions, and pop-up markets. Translation has enabled neighborhood residents to share their artistic talents and cultural traditions with each other and the greater Dallas community. Lowe has initiated uh, similarly arts-driven redevelopment projects in other cities, including the Watts House Project in Los Angeles and a post-Katrina building effort in New Orleans. In September of last year, he was awarded the MacArthur Genius Award for Project Row Houses. For the field of social practice, art that requires the engagement and particip participation of its audience, Lowe's Genius Grant draws attention to this growing art form. Lowe's pioneering social sculptures, as he likes to refer to them, have inspired a generation of artists to explore more socially engaged forms of art making in communities across the country. It is my pleasure to introduce Rick Lowe. Thank you. Thank you, Shirley, for that great introduction. Um, okay, so, so yeah, to, I'm gonna give some illustrations of this uh, social sculpture practice of mine, and, but I'll, I'll contextualize it in the context of uh, uh, the critic Lucy Lepard. Anybody know Lucy Lepard? Lucy Lepard wrote a, an article on land art a little, little while back, and, um, I can't remember the exact quote, but you know, to kind of paraphrase it, she was basically saying that the purpose of land art is to give focus for the untrained eye that didn't have the capacity to see the beauty and the vastness of you know the landscape, right? And um, and I just thought it was real interesting, you know, that you know you that the role of the artist is really to hone in and focus and show people the special things that are the special qualities that that most times we can't really see right and so you can take that same that same approach and you could apply it to uh you know the ready-mades right 
with Duchamp. You know, Duchamp placed the urinal on a pedestal, which is just an everyday object. But because he gave it that focus that we could once we could, we had the opportunity to look at, you know, everyday objects in a way in search of deeper meaning and deeper value. And so in the context of the social, there's a similar situation, right? That we live our lives every day doing, you know, the mundane things of life. But if we could like kind of slice out a little bit and think about some of those actions in, a, in an isolated way, we could find maybe the beauty and the inspiration even within those mundane things, right? As Joseph Boy said, you know, uh, in, sculpt, in social sculpture, if you're creating um, and transforming the world, it means everybody has to, right? And so how do we inspire everyone to reach deeper within themselves to find those moments in the ordinary in which it becomes extraordinary, right? And that's the whole purpose of art, right? Is to elevate things in that way. And so, <clears throat> so I've been doing that. I've been practicing that over the past, uh, you know, 20 plus years. And I'll just give you a few examples of that uh, in this presentation this evening. So, so this evening I'm gonna talk to you about these three different projects. Um, Project Row Houses, Translation, which is Project Row Houses in Houston, Translation in Dallas. And then the third one is a proposed project in uh, Florida that I, I'll, I'll explain why I'm gonna talk about that. But each of these have different, you know, hopefully it'll sh be able to provide different insight into my thinking and the way that I work because they came about in different ways. Project Row Houses came about as a strictly, uh, purely an artist-driven initiated project. There was no institution uh, involved in, uh, in commissioning or facilitating it. And then translation was uh, a project that came about through an exhibition at the Nasher. And then you have the project in Opalaka is was basically a traditional public art commission uh, that I sought to kind of mutate the process in a way that actually turned out to be unsuccessful at this point, but I'm still hopeful that it, maybe it'll unfold later as we go along. But um, okay, so starting with Project Row Houses, we kind of say the start date was 1994 because that's when we opened publicly, but really the project started almost two years prior to that in terms of you know the conceptualization of it and a lot of the background organizing stuff that it takes to, to kind of get it to the point where you open. So 94 is good enough to start with. But to give you a little bit of framework, I mean a background about starting the project was that I had been doing painting and doing political, uh, I guess you could call it political art that focused on all kind of social and you know political issues. And, um, but I was challenged to kind of push further and once I took that challenge by closing my studio and trying to figure out how I could make work that was both uh, symbolic and poetic. Uh, I mean, uh, that, was, that was symbolic and poetic, but also had a practical application to it as well. And that's what led me to the Joseph Boyce uh, concept. So I was thinking about this concept of social sculpture, but had no platform through which to address it until one day I was on a bus ride with a group of activists in the third ward neighborhood of Houston where activists had pulled together city and county officials to get on a bus and drive through the neighborhood and identify dangerous places that needed to be torn down. And, um, and so I asked if I could go along and they allowed me to and these were the condition of some of the houses that they were pointing out. And, they actually, and the houses at the very bottom are the ones that turned out to be project row houses. But they basically were saying that those were the worst houses in the entire community. And I agreed with them at the time, but later after, um, after, you know, after thinking about this idea of social sculpture and trying to figure out you know, how can I apply that, I started connecting those houses with these paintings by John Biggers. John Biggers basically created a, a mythology around the, the, the shotgun house and its value and its connection to uh, African American history and culture. And so I decided that maybe these little houses that we were talking about tearing down could actually be a vehicle for exploring this, uh, the value that John Biggers talked about uh, in terms of the shotgun house 
in uh, African American history, but also exploring this concept of social sculpture. So that was the that was the thing that kind of got me going on this. And um, and so the first part of um, of the process of exploring, you know, John Bigger's concept of of, of the value of the shotgun house was to unpack it, right? To unpack those paintings and find out what was the true value in there. And basically I kind of concluded that there were four areas that he focused on in his paintings. He focused on the architecture of the, um, you know, of the houses as the kind of the, 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 the structure of the painting, right? The composition and everything was built on the architecture. But he also talked about creativity and you know, he showed that with, you know, these women on the porches weaving and doing all kinds of making things, right? People made things uh, out of necessity. So their creativity was not something that was a luxury. It was a, a, a source of survival. And, um, and he also talked about education in there. You can see a lot of that in terms of uh, in some of the paintings, you, he shows the back courtyard areas where, you know, people are sharing wisdom from here and there. And then the, um, the final piece was a, uh, a social safety net. He talked about how these communities facilitated a, um, a, a strong social safety net for those who were kind of struggling. I remember talking to him once and he was saying how people say that these shotgun houses weren't worth living in, but he said, you know, if you think back, you know, you know, into the 1920s, 30s, 40s or whatever, where many people lived in shotgun houses, you didn't have nearly the kind of homelessness that you have now. And um, and so so he he put a lot of focus on the kind of community, the the community aspect of what happens in the shotgun uh, shotgun houses. And so so for me as an artist, you know, it was kind of trying to figure out how to con conceptually frame this in a way that was interesting, that could uh, capture the imagination of people, that would push it beyond just a you know a, a housing renovation project and that kind of stuff so I had to kind of play with all that stuff weaving in the Joseph Boy's kind of uh, conceptualism with the John Biggers you know historic and kind of almost kind of a uh, mythological uh, 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 rendition of the the shotgun house and figuring out how to layer all this stuff into a development and making it bringing it into reality and, uh, and so the process was a real interesting process of pulling in loads of artists, neighborhood folks, community organizations, and so on and so forth, until we were able to work through reclaiming these houses from, uh, from the state they were in and start programming them in ways that start to uh, sh shift it from being one of the, what was called when I went on the tour, that it was the worst place in the entire neighborhood, to being one of the actual highlights of of the neighborhood. And so then there are, um, uh, so we honored the architecture and we played around with the architecture just by renovating the houses and cleaning it up and making sure that, that, uh, that there was some dignity uh, given to them. But then we wanted to weave in the art and creativity so we set up an art program that actually bring in artists from around the world actually. So it's a combination of neighborhood artists, international artists, and so on and so forth that do art projects. And, and that's the thing that keeps the project connected in a way that, um, uh, that keeps it fresh, right? We're always relying on new energy of artists that come in and teach us how to communicate and how to connect with, uh, with the community in different ways. And so these are just four examples. Um, many of you might recognize on the may know this artist who, whose work on the top right hand corner is uh, Tracy Hicks uh, who passed away recently a Dallas based artist and um, this was a wonderful probably one of the most significant projects of Project Door Houses of his entire history because of the way Tracy uh, kind of helped us understand connecting with the community as a non-African American coming into the community that was setting out to do a project that he wanted to do a photographic project. This is before digital and everybody had cameras and everybody had the phones shooting stuff. But Terry, I mean, I care, Tracy went out and got uh, disposable cameras. And, um, and, instead, and so instead of him taking the photographs, he actually walked the neighborhood meeting people uh, daily and asking them if they would take a camera and document their neighborhood. And once they did that, he built the structure inside and place these little uh, 
uh, canning jars and, uh, and allow people to come in and edit and put their own photographs in and write notes and that kind of stuff. And so it was really this wonderful process of really opening it up and making sure that people in the neighborhood were you know, connected. And, uh, and so there's a variety of different kinds of projects that have happened. I'm not going to go through uh, a lot of that because that could take a long time. And there's been so many artists that have gone through and uh, worked on projects here. But there was another component of it was you know, trying to figure out how to, how to make, our, make, make ourselves useful in a, in a lot of different ways. So there were a lot of young people that were coming to the project as we were cleaning it up and trying to get it going. And so for about a year, we did informal um, informal mentoring, but at a certain point we realized we needed to develop a specific program for that. And so we developed an after school and summer education program that worked with uh, youth from the neighborhood. And actually, you know, kind of helping them, this is, this, these are images from, uh, I think it was 2004 project where it was about 12 youth that we took through a process of them looking four places within the community they could have an impact. They found this little place that had seven abandoned houses on it. They negotiated um, uh, a purchase agreement on it. Actually, they got it donated to them. They did the design work, working with artists to design it, and, um, uh, and, and did a lot of the construction on it as well. So, you know, it was kind of a, so education is a key component of the whole John, John Biggers concept of what, what builds community. and. Uh, and so that was our way of, of, of addressing that. And then there's the so social safety net side came in after we had, an, we had the arts program going and an education program. And, uh, but people from the neighborhood start telling us that while you know, we like the arts and it's good stuff for the kids, um, you know, people need housing. I mean, housing is scarce here. It's lots of housing's falling down. And then you had groups like the uh, community organizing group that was actually advocating for derelict houses to be you know demolished and so there was a housing issue there now we could have easily have decided since we had you know 22 houses we dedicated uh, 10 of them for arts programming five for the educational activities and that left us seven so we could have easily have done a um, uh, an artist residency program but for some reason that didn't seem like it would address really the needs in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the context that we were working in. So someone came up with an idea that there, were, that there was a high percentage of single mothers in, in the neighborhood and that maybe we should try to do something there. So the question was then, so how do you make you know, a housing program, you know, what does the housing program have to do with art? And so that was a challenge for us to figure out how to frame that conceptually. And what we ended up doing was taking it from the standpoint of making this program symbolic. Right, so starting with the actual structure itself, the house structure itself. So we had, you know, interior designers uh, to uh, to actually, well, architects to redesign the structures of the interior of the houses, and interior designers to actually go in and actually do the uh, uh, to to you know furnish the houses. And uh, in a way, the point of that was to do it in a way that that went beyond what people could imagine these little houses could be like, right? And, uh, and then that was also set up to challenge these young mothers because it's a transitional housing program. They get to live there for a year to two years. The point is, was to, to put them in a place that, 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 you know, that elevated their expectations of, you know, of, of what we could provide for them and what they could do for themselves. And so this program has you know, become a great signature program in terms of housing, in terms of how you actually work with people who are struggling and then move them along. There's so many successes of this project. It's just as uh, uh, many stories there as it is about the art projects. So once we were able to get, you know, honor the architecture, uh, develop, you know, an arts program, have an education program, and then the social safety net in the 22 houses, we, we realized that we had kind of built an interesting little community there that we wanted to see if we could expand upon. And so we started to work with architects to design new constructed houses that honored the, the historic architecture and in, in, in that there would be some continuity as opposed to the way that things generally develop in Houston where you know, there's no continuity at all. All right, so, so as you can see, uh, 
we're located in, let's see, I don't know how to work this. Okay, yeah, we're located here. And, um, and then you have downtown, University of Houston, Texas Southern University, the Medical Center, and the Museum District. We're right in the middle. And, all, and what made this a, a challenging and interesting uh, uh, place for a low-income community is that the, um, is that it was is designated as a low-income community, so there were there were there were advantages to that, right, in terms of federal funding for the uh, for the city or for the medical center, right. So everybody wanted to grow, and everybody wanted to use that zip code, you know, and kind of target that, and so it just put this pressure on what we were doing here, and and the pressure kind of ended up resulting in, you know, what we understood what happened is the um, center. That's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll go with this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So yeah. So we, you know, I mean, we could see in other neighborhoods where there were, um, uh, you know, little shotgun houses being taken down and and being replaced by larger townhouses at a at a at a price that was far beyond what people uh, in our community could afford. And so we responded to that by basically buying additional property and working with architects to figure out how to you know, kind of cr continue to create examples of housing types that made sense, that had some kind of relationship with, within the context of the neighborhood. So a combination of, um, of building new houses, but also uh, rehabbing existing houses, as well as introducing you know, kind of modern designs from time to time. And, um, and so we were kind of moving along in a very incremental uh, stage and fortunately at that time the real estate was so uh, inexpensive that we could move incrementally right I mean when we started out uh, with this project uh, land was a, a dollar a square foot and uh, and so and it gradually went up to you know 2005 or so it was it was somewhere around four to six dollars but so it's been so it was always kind of you know affordable so in addition to doing housing and that kind of stuff, we start thinking about, you know, broadly about the neighborhood, you know, the, 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 the commercial quarter, you know, which is basically nothing there now. And so we started to figure out how we could play around with incubating artists or people that were interested in doing small businesses as a way of setting the tone for the kinds of things we wanted to see come back in the neighborhood. Instead of, so instead of large, uh, supermarkets we wanted you know small uh, mom and pop you know groceries and that kind of stuff so these are a couple of examples of uh, an online radio uh, 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 group that we were incubating as well as a, a food co-op and as you can see this is um, I mean this is proximity to downtown we've mainly this is the original 22 houses here and we've kind of we've built this up and others around in this area and um, and you can see the proximity to downtown but what's interesting about the image is that right in this area here was our neighborhood park and it's a park that is very historic it's called Emancipation Park it was designed I mean not designed it was um, uh, paid for by freed slaves uh, that wanted to have a public space and they put together this property and gave it to the city to, uh, uh, to operate it as a park. And, um, and it's a park that's been somewhat neglected over the years and, uh, and so people in the community always wanted to have some investment to happen and finally uh, uh, the city decided they would put in four million dollars into the park and we came up with a, you know, a budget for about six million which meant the community had to raise two and um, and that seemed fair enough, you know, if we because it's only a ten acre park, so you could kind of do some infrastructural stuff and, and and enhance the park. But there were other people that wanted to be more ambitious, and they wanted something that was grander and something that, you know, they, they were you know they wanted something that was a signature thing in the neighborhood. And um, and and so this is what they well the the budget for it just kept going up right so it went up from 6 million to 12 million went up to 20 million it went up to 30 million it actually finally in uh topped off at 38 million and um and the and this is you know designed for this park right so it's a 
uh, and all of these structures here, let's see, they're, this is all new structures here. And uh, so you're losing a lot of the green space and that kind of stuff. But it was, you know, but it's making this statement, right? But the problem with that is, you know, people, you know, hear the statement and they figure out how they can take advantage of it. And so the real estate speculators all immediately honed in on it as being a park that was that close to downtown. Real estate was very expensive, so they just start buying. And it, so by 2010, real estate was, uh, the land value was somewhere around, you know, 12 to $15 a square foot, which was still, you know, I mean, it was higher, but it was, you know, manageable growth. But when they announced that this park was uh, going to be developed and the amount of money that was invested in, it went from, uh, you know, 15 or so dollars a square foot in 2013 upward to 35. Now it's over $40 a square foot. So it's put a lot of pressure in terms of development. And, um, and then if you look at the, uh, you know, the kind of the, the, the median rent income, I mean, uh, prices that people were paying, it's way below anything that could sustain, you know, the kind of developments that were going to have to happen with the uh, real estate prices as they are. And so consequently, these are the new developments that are coming in the last uh, uh, you know, uh, couple of years, uh, no noting that this one is kind of now setting the market at you know, $610,000 for uh, a townhouse in our area, which then leads to the whole marketing of our neighborhood now, you know, is being marketed as this kind of potentially new glitzy place that's uh, that is for you know people that um, that that want to come and uh, and be closer in into uh, into town. And once again, driving the uh, affordability up significantly for people that uh, live in the neighborhood. And then you know the city of Houston placed these; uh, they they put out these. Um, uh, weekly replatting maps, right? So replatting is when somebody buy you know a lot that may have a single family house on it, and they want to put you know three or four on it. You have to replat it, right? And so these were all replats from one week, in uh, uh, in that was in the middle of middle of the summer. So you can see that there's like an aggressive approach to development. Uh, I'm working with a, a group of uh, planners from MIT though to kind of respond to some of this. And some of the things that we found that was really interesting was that during that month, though, as much uh, replatting that was actually happening, when we looked at all the community institutions that own property, we still own a great deal of it. And so now the challenge is, you know, figuring out how to actually, you know, activate that. And so now Project Row Houses is really in a hyper uh, planning uh, uh, situation, and it's been really invigorating though because I think the urgency of the situation with the neighborhood is really kind of open things up right so you've got um, uh, we've got we have 14 churches there's small businesses the schools and everybody's really kind of you know invested in this process that we're going through to try to figure out how we can kind of at least balance out this new development that's happening so this is a 20-year view of a, of a project that continues to fund offer opportunities for me as an artist but also as a as a um, as a vital community uh, uh, community organization so but now I'm going to switch to uh, translation in uh, Vickery Meadow which is uh, which we kind of kicked that off in 2013 and as I said it was a it this project came about because of the um, the National Sculpture Center is celebrating their 10th year anniversary. Invited 10 different artists to do 10 projects in different places in the city. And they asked me to visit Vickery Meadow, which I didn't know very much about it. I didn't know anything about it, actually. And, um, and when I went through my initial drive through, I was really puzzled as to why they wanted me to see this neighborhood, because it was just all these little garden style apartments and uh, it did, nothing seemed particularly interesting about it right but they were telling me that that you know that it was one of the most dense neighborhoods in in the city and as I kind of think about it it's probably one of the most dense places in the state of Texas because it's uh, within this 
that blue area, which is all residential, uh, there's some, and it's fluctuated too. I mean, at one point, some people estimate there were up to 50,000 people living in there. Uh, now it's somewhere around 30,000. But there is, uh, uh, I think at maybe at the high point, there was some uh, uh, 15 to 16,000 apartment units in that in that area. So it's a, lots of you know lots of folks. And um, well, what's interesting about it was as I went back through it. Well, first of all, they, everybody would tell me that you know it's such a dangerous place, you know, and that's all they talked about was the crime and and danger and stuff. And when I went there, it was just interesting to go through a neighborhood where you know there is this projected you know uh, presence of danger. You know, I mean, from the the police tower to you know, there's loads of police cars always around, and uh, and so there was this sense of of danger. But a lot of people were complaining, though, that that it was coming from the population that was living there. And let me tell you, the population there was a population shift that happened, right? Apparently, when this when uh, when it was built in the uh, I think most of these places were built in the 70s, early 70s. It was mostly uh, designed for single um, recent college grads, mostly white, you know, places that they could have an apartment, garden apartments. And that was at a time when everybody, you know, it was just normal, right? That you wanted a place where you could drive your car into your parking lot. You know, each apartment complex has its, you know, you know, pool room and all that kind of stuff. And then when you needed things in the city, you'd get in your car and you'd drive out and you'd go do stuff, right? But uh, with depreciation, there was a shift in the, um, in the demographics and a lot of lower income folks start moving in, uh, blacks and Latinos. But then apparently in the uh, early 2000s, the International Refugee Committee uh, uh, was attracted to that site because there were so many apartments there in numbers. And there, so there were always going to be vacancies, so they could place refugees there. And then all of a sudden, there was this huge shift in terms of what uh, you know the the population looked like, you know, in uh, in in the neighborhood. And um, and then I, I've sort you know as I was thinking about it, I was thinking about the contradiction. I mean, that's what 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 you know excited me as an artist, trying to kind of figure out about this contradiction. On the one hand, that you know in America we talk about how great diversity is and how much we need it and all, you know. And then you look at a neighborhood like this that had probably one of the most dynamic diversity situations that I've ever seen, but it was just seen as a place that was, you know, in, in a negative, right? And so I was trying to figure that out, you know, and like, what does that mean? And how, how do you, you know, how do you, you know, how do, how do we think about that? And so I started to to try to I mean that's what attracted me to it as a challenge you know how do you figure out this 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 contradiction, and so I started to ask people you know what's the deal with all the crime and you know why do people you know why is it that way, and I ended up talking to one woman who told me about a, a program that they were doing because she said that they didn't think all the crime was coming from because there were so many criminals there or whatever she thought maybe the crime was coming because. There were all these new people coming in, and people didn't know each other. And so, maybe if we could figure out a way to get people to talk to each other, then you know we could deal with some of the the crime. And so, what they started was something called the Mom's Lunch. And uh, and what they would do is they would invite four to five different women from you know five or six different countries, and uh, and they would have food, and they would just talk. You know, they would have them talk, and it was all women. And uh, and when I heard about it, I was I wanted to go, but of course I'm not a woman, so they were like, you know, you can't, you know, this is this is not, you know, this is for this, you know, one of a safe place for women and that kind of stuff. And so, you know, I convinced them at some point, you know, to just let me go and sit in the back, you know, and I just went and I sat uh, in the corner and just observed. And I tell you, it was one of the most amazing uh, experiences I've ever had. Right, sitting there, listening to these women tell the most incredible stories you know I mean there's stories about their lives and their struggles and their travels and you know as refugees and stuff and um, so so just from the content of it, it was really incredible but then the form was also interesting because you know when somebody would tell the story then it had to be translated into English so 
And then a person would translate it into English, and then it gets translated back out to everybody else in their language, right? So it was this kind of this buzz of sound, you know, that was just amazingly beautiful. And uh, and I just thought, wow, this if 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 I could do something that has a broader public, you know, situation like that, that would be great. You know, so how do you get people to, together in that way, in a way that's public but is not exploiting them? And um, and so I kept thinking about it and. Um, and and as I was going through, actually, the image at the top is from uh, uh, one of the, the the mom's lunches, right? And so the the people that are standing are the translators, and so it's constantly, you know, they have they have like translators from all the different groups. But as I was, you know, thinking about that and walking the streets and stuff, and I start there was something that gave me a little bit of a clue. I start seeing people try to sell things on the streets, and this is like a but this is a neighborhood that has no street activity. There's no public amenities. It's like it's all residential, and uh, and then it occurred to me though, it's like, but you know what? That's second nature for uh, uh, immigrants, right? And people from third world countries or whatever. It's like they, you know, they market things, right? And so that's how people get to know each other through trade and stuff. So I thought maybe if we could create a market, that might be a, a way to get people together in a way that they can share culturally. Uh, and be a part of what people are focusing on, but they're also impacting it, and they have an agency in it. And so I've asked for, I asked a bunch of artists in, in uh, Dallas if they would join me on this journey, and we spent a great deal of time walking the streets, talking to people, going to meet, uh, meetings, and just talking to people about you know this market idea. And uh, and you know, and to me, that's one of the most. This is one of the most exciting phases of a project when you get to listen to people and you get to talk to them, and they get to tell you their their dreams and their all their stuff, you know. And and uh, and this turned out to be really great because I got a chance to eat a lot of great food. You know, people would invite you to uh, invite us to dinner. Uh, uh, on the right hand side was a uh, uh, an Iraqi meal that was uh, prepared for us. On the left hand side was a uh, Bhutanese and and. Uh, but in, in these places, you know, we're trying to talk to people about this idea of a market because we're trying to figure out how do we get things to the market? What do we have at the market? And, um, and most of these folks, you know, they, you know, you talk to them about art and arts and crafts and stuff, and they don't really, it's, it's not something that they're thinking about, right? And just an example of how, how, how challenging it was for us to, to tease this out on people was that one of the artists was at a meeting and she was, talking to them and telling them that we were looking for people that made things, you know, any kind of crafts or arts and that kind of stuff, and nobody would say anything. And then she looked at the woman on the left-hand side, and she asked her about that little black bag there. She says, oh, where'd you get that? That's kind of nice. She goes, oh, I made it. And she was like, well, that's what we're talking about. You know, that's the kind of stuff we want, you know. And, and so we start, you know, kind of, you know, slowly getting people to you know, to, to, to reveal things that they did in their homes, right? And we start trying to convince them that they had value. So we thought, once we could see that, then we said, so we have to figure out a mechanism through which we can, you know, get people to come to us because we can't keep going to everybody and finding everybody in their homes. So we actually got two apartments uh, in Vickery Meadow donated to us, and we started uh, workshop spaces. And so there were artists that were on a team that started teaching the workshops in the beginning, but as we suspected, uh, very quickly people start to understand it by seeing it, right? They didn't understand it when we were talking to them about arts and crafts, but when they would come to the space and they'd say, oh, I, I can do that, you know, and I do this, and they start, so they start teaching the workshops, and so it kind of moved along uh, uh, in that way. So once we start thinking about the, um, about uh, this getting people to make things for the market, we had our the opportunity to to test it right to see if we could do a market in the middle of the neighborhood and would people come because of course uh most folks would think that you know a place like Vickery Meadow that's you know that 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 the whole city thinks that it's unsafe nobody's going to go there for anything and then um and then you have a situation where people in the neighborhood are saying that because people don't know each other they're not going to you know they're, they're not going to come out so we 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 formed it. Uh, we set out for the first test to be around food, and we call it the lucky pot, right? And we thought, 
we thought maybe we could get a, you know five or six people that would come out and bring food from their different cultures, and, and that would be the basis of celebration. But we were really surprised that once we, you know, once we kind of, you know, once we got it going and the work got out, we had people to come. We had like 18 different, um, different folks, I mean, you know, gr- folks from different groups. And, um, uh, you know, it just turned out to be this great celebration with folks from all over the neighborhood, from different, uh, different, um, uh, different parts of the community, as well as people coming in from outside, right? So that was the first test for us to see, you know, if this thing could possibly happen. And, um, and then, and then after we did that, we, we thought that, you know, we need to add another layer to it. And so we came up with this idea for a, uh, a talent show, which, you know, I wasn't so much of an advocate for because I thought, you know, I don't know how a talent show is going to work. But a, a young, uh, young Latino guy that was working with us at a time, he says, you know, I think we can do it. You know, it'll be great. So, so, so in the making of the flyer, though, all of these things become, you know, part of the process, right? Of thinking creatively about, you know, how do you play with this, right? And so, you know, as we were thinking about this flyer and people were saying, well, you just got to have some of everybody's language there. You know, even if it doesn't tell the whole story of what's happening, if they could see something that's relevant to them, then it might be, um, you know, you know, they might feel connected to it. So this was the, the, our first event that was the, uh, that included uh, uh, entertainment uh, activities. And once again, it just kind of, you know, it went way beyond, you know, what we had had expected, right? So there were people from all over, uh, all over the neighborhood, all over the city, uh, coming to, to check this out. And, and the talent show just turned out to be really amazing, right? Because we had, a, instead of the, you know, 10 or 15 uh, folks, we ended up having about 26 uh, different uh, performers, ranging from a 16 or 18 month old little Somalia girl dancing to uh, an 86 year old white guy doing a hokey pokey. And, <laughs> And then, and then, the, and then, and then you had like all these other things that were happening in between, right? So you had like, you know, you had like these older, um, uh, you know, Iraqi women or you know, you know, South Asian women that are sitting there, and men sitting there watching these young African American hip hop folks, you know, rap, you know, whatever. And then you have like the young Latinos, African Americans sitting around watching you know Bhutanese dancers and all that you know it was just really interesting to see how people were engaged with you know exploring each other's culture in a way that uh, that you rarely get to see which was you know it's pretty exciting so then all of a sudden you know this little area um, uh, at the uh, the apartment that we that we chose in fact well, one of the things I left out too is that we chose this apartment uh, this particular apartment location because there's a little that tree in the background there. It was really a, a nice shady thing, and we thought, you know, it's great to have a great shady place, you know, if you're going to gather people and stuff. And so that was the location that we chose. But people in the neighborhood were saying, yeah, well, there are other people that have chose that too, and that's the drug dealers, right? They want the shady tree. And so, so, so we kind of slowly moved in, and the drug dealers moved out, you know. And uh, and so all of a sudden, you know you know, we called it the big tree, you know, the big tree was a host for, you know, young children coming through doing things, uh, you know, musicians performing, and it was right outside of the apartment where people were doing, you know, their workshops and so on and so forth. So it just uh, kind of shifts things. Um, wait a minute, I think I must be out of, okay. Um, so, so then I, um, so then I, um, after doing the markets and stuff, and I was thinking about how there were some of the artists that had, um, whose work was a little bit different and it had a higher quality than, than just, and it needed a better context to be shown instead of just on a table at a market. And so I was thinking about you know, how we could do that and so we played around with the idea of maybe getting some other apartments and you know, whitewashing the, the walls and, and, uh, and, 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 putting it, and doing shows in there. But I was talking to a friend of mine, Mark Bradford, uh, an artist from LA who was we were, he was excitedly talking about his first show at uh, White Cube in London, and he was excited about it because he was like, you know, it was his that show was going to push some of his work over the million dollar mark, you know. And I'm going like, what? <laughs> so, so he was like, he, and we talked about it, and he was just talking about the commercialization of things, and he was talking about how like White Cube it really 
figured it out. They've just narrowed it down to this thing of just simplifying, you know, white cube meaning value, you know, and that kind of thing. And uh, and so as I was, you know, talking, I'm thinking, well, heck, we need some white cubes in Vickery Meadow, right? <laughs> and so so after you know, so after talking to Mark about it, I, you know, I was, uh, uh, in Vickery Meadow, and I was talking to uh, one of the architects that works in the neighborhood, and I was saying you know, we really need some spaces for people to exhibit. And they, you know, maybe just 12 by 12 feet square. Just that's, that'll be, you know, good enough. And, um, and I put the challenge out there and he, he took it on and, uh, and they basically came up with these, uh, these white cubes, right? And, uh, and, and they became, you know, spaces that were, that served multiple functions, right? One of the things that we were concerned about was that since we had these apartments that were in the heart of the neighborhood, uh, there was still nothing on the streets to get people there, and and then and, and as I said, you know the the uh, the neighborhood was not designed for foot traffic, but with this new population, all these you know uh, immigrants and refugees, you know, the, you know they didn't have the resources to be coming in and out of the neighborhood. Their neighborhood had to be the place that they lived, and so we felt like you know these cubes could actually add to that as a possibility. So. So there were three cubes that were kind of placed along, uh, along the way that allowed us to be able to do, you know, exhibitions that uh, that folks from you know inside and outside the neighborhood could come and uh, and, and check them out, and uh, and so 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 the process of that phase of the project, which was uh, which was all um, kind of doing the time span of the Nasher uh, exhibition. Uh, uh, was was framed to be kind of you know uh, exhibition oriented, right? It had to frame itself within the context of an ex exhibition. But then after that, then there was an opportunity to say, okay, so let's step back and see how the project actually fits within the neighborhood, how it's responding to things that are going on, and uh, and some of the some of the clues that start coming up to to make us shift a little bit were that the property owners were uh, not being as uh, uh, supportive as we thought they might, right? Because we, you know, for instance, one of the white cubes that was uh, uh, that we were asked to move, the first white cube we were asked to move, we asked, well, why, why, why do you want to move it? I mean, it's working just fine, right? I mean, there are people there, you know, and it just, you know, it, you know, it even serves as a as a as a bus stop for people sometimes. You know, if it's raining, you know, they can get in out of the rain and all that kind of stuff. But people are there, and they and their response was that. That's exactly the point. They didn't want people there, right? and so, so, so you know, there. I think the property owners have this idea of kind of thinking about the glory days of, you know, the neighborhood as being, you know, this quiet garden apartment kind of place. Whereas, you know, the reality though is just very different. And uh, and I think also being in a situation where where translation started to feed the. Uh, 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 the media with positive things to say about Vickery Meadow, and I think real estate people start to see that as an opportunity for them to start thinking about, you know, how to capitalize on that, on that value, and um, and so so we start kind of feeling there was a little bit of a conflict there. So instead of continuing uh, in the apartment and trying to stay within the neighborhood and doing the white cubes there, we slowly kind of pulled ourselves back so that we could focus really on the people that we were most interested in working with, right? The uh, the people that were uh, uh, the, the underserved people of, of the neighborhood. So this is actually one of the cubes that moved to a larger open space, and uh, and it's been very I've been very fortunate to have a young artist who just graduated from Otis College of Art, who came often to our market events and um, uh, on her own. She would just because she was her family lives in Austin, so she would whenever we had markets, she would come. To visit her folks and just drive over to uh, uh, to Dallas and uh, and she hung out with us and then now you know she's the project manager there so she is the the person that's kind of driving the project in a real in a very different way but very very interesting because she's you know she's there on a daily basis and able to kind of work these programs in real interesting ways so things from uh, uh, you know language workshops art making workshops. Uh, all kinds of things and even but the thing I love about you know this community is how you know people are not slow to 
uh, assert themselves to be involved in in making things happen so this is a back space behind our building and uh, and we had a group from SMU that uh, that was going to build these little um, uh, uh, garden beds but then you can see on the upper you know right in uh, the upper left hand side you know that these are uh, these are folks from the neighborhood you know young people that are out there preparing it you know and then and then uh, then of course people actually doing the gardening there's really absolutely wonderful um, uh, community there and uh, and Carol's been coming up with you know just num numerous great uh, programs so, like this one I, I, I'm really fond of this right this idea of you know I am beautiful because basically you have people that are in a neighborhood that have different ideas and different notions of beauty right and so you know for people to be able to sit and and have moments where they get to experience what other people call beauty and why do they do the things they do where does it where does the culture come from you know where does the you know the thick eyeline of you know a lot of people that wear you know women that wear the thick thick black you know uh, eyeliner and that kind of stuff where does that stuff come from and understanding it and stuff um, it's really pretty fantastic and then her most recent thing and actually there was an article in the Dallas Morning News about this one uh, where she's been working with uh, folks in the neighborhood who cook and they're getting they got the certification to uh, to actually uh, to actually prepare and that's Carol in the blue in the center there with uh, some of the uh, uh, the the young chefs so it's uh, so this project has been one that's been really really you know a fantastic project and it's uh, and as I said it's different than Project Row Houses because Project Row Houses started as you know an artist initiated project. This one started as a project through a museum show, and uh, and you know and so the the challenges has been you know how do we take it from that from the museum show into a community based organization and also but but balance out though and leverage the value that the museum brings to the project uh, at the same time of really you know deepening it as a community based uh, community based effort now the, um, the, the the this project is a project that didn't happen um, and it was more of a um, uh, a uh, a proposal and I'm going to run through it fairly quickly here but just to show you how one of the things that I'm interested in is this notion of you know how do we get everybody to participate creatively how do we get everybody to be to practice as an artist and uh, and so this was this group was doing a traditional public art program and uh, they wanted sculpture I don't do sculpture I didn't want to apply for it and I kept saying I'm not interested but then they uh, the consultant that was working on it you know she was like we really need you in on this and and she sent me this thing about what their goals were and as you can see, I mean, there's some pretty interesting goals, right? When I start reading things like integrating art into the everyday and the functional, uh, developing a sense of place, engage, engaging residents and local businesses and stuff, I thought that those are the three things that kind of captured me. And I thought those are interesting things to work with, right? So how how can we do this? And uh, and one of the things about you know Florida is we all kind of know that. Florida has a tendency to kind of do these make-believe things, right? So, so you know, when they were showing me around, they were talking, they were highlighting this Moorish architecture, like they have more Moorish architectural buildings in, in Opalaka than any other place or whatever. You know, I'm thinking, what does that have to do with South Florida? But, but, but playing on that, right? Saying, okay, so they can they can do that. You can you can do make-believe. You can stretch things. You can connect things in in, in interesting ways. So, so we. Um, so we wanted to, you know, keep that in mind as we thought about this project. And so, but this was the the location, and their plan was that they wanted where these little circles are. They wanted sculpture there uh, that they would call them gateways. And um, and the reason that they were going to do this was that apparently in the 1980s, all of these streets had been blocked off because apparently crime was so bad there that they didn't want people driving through the neighborhood. So if you went in, you had to go back out the same way you went in. And so, but now things were different. And so they said, you know, we you know, we want to do something that's going to highlight and showcase the neighborhood. Well, the problem with it, though, was that, you know, still a very low income neighborhood. And as I walked around, I put together a team of artists that were around the South Florida area. And, uh, and we walked the neighborhood, we talked to people. And the thing that, that we ended up recording that we heard the most from people that, first of all, people were skeptical that, that 
people only wanted to come to uh, to to run them off. I mean, you know, to to displace them. And then and then they said the second thing was saying, you know, if if people really you know care about this neighborhood and want to do something, we need jobs. You know, that's the you know that's the main thing that we need. So we took that into consideration and started thinking about you know how do we build confidence that we're not going to run people off, and how do we also think about you know this as an opportunity for employment. And so and so at these little um, uh, these sites where they wanted the um, uh, the gateways, there were these little buildings, and they were going to tear them down so that they could put sculpture up. And uh, but we kind of challenged the the idea, right? We said, let's let's break this thing up and and not think about objects at this point. Let's think about things that give the na aestheticize the neighborhood and having the people that are living there be a part of it, right? So we thought about civic design. We could look at preservation of those little buildings. We could look at aesthetic and visual enhancements and landscaping and try to you know, teach people how to do this stuff through these, what we're calling public art activities, right? An education zone, employment zone, social zone, and so on and so forth. And, um, and, and so in terms of that kind of aesthetic enhancement, you know, we we're reaching out, right? Like they could go get Moorish architecture. We said, well, we could start looking, playing off of like a traditional African, I mean, an African tradition of women painting the houses in these geometric shapes. Um, there's also, you know, landscape issues on the right-hand side, of kind of a typical southern thing where people would sweep, you know, certain parts of the landscape so it would be designed in. And it was, so we're thinking about things like that that we could, you know, we could uh, we could start to teach people those things and they could actually do it themselves and become part of the artist, right? And so these are just some examples we were showing them how it could fall into rebuilding the infrastructure. So instead of you know, doing some, you know, a sculpture or whatever on on that on on one of those uh, those cul-de-sacs, then you can actually, you know, use some of those resources to rebuild walls of fences that were there and and use those as opportunities to aestheticize them. And even with people's houses, right? You can do so, certain things that. And also, it was about engaging people, though. You know, so if you so if you're going to if you're going to do this at someone's house, you have to engage them, right? So they have to be engaged in the process. So that was a big part of it was, you know, getting everybody engaged and even commercial uh, uh, opportunities there. And so, so, you know, we just kind of, you know, we were giving examples of other projects we worked on where, you know, how people go about it, you know, and you kind of work with people in different ways. And you could have these areas where, where you can have this combination of, you know, uh, sculpture shows of whatever uh, in in the landscape area that people in the neighborhood have landscaped themselves. But the process was one that we were talking about where it wasn't that you just clear out things and you would you know install something new. You would start with what you have and you would slowly start to you know integrate you know aesthetic components into it and uh, even going to the point that if you get your landscaping right and you get everything in you can even maybe throw in a little Tiny uh, du buffet, maybe if that's what you if that's what you like. But but the point was but the point was just kind of this idea of like having the people in the neighborhood participate and be a part of this process. And, ha and but the real the real radical part of this proposal was the was the the budgeting of it, though, right? That what we were basically saying was that uh, in the we weren't gonna we were gonna spread this money out over a four year period of time. And, uh, and not have it focus on you know the traditional kind of production mechanism, but we were going to have the 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 um, uh, the, um, uh, the the ma majority of the money was going to go to residents that we were training to be artists. They were going to be the people that were working through it. And then, and but then, as you see, how in year three, the red there it gets smaller for the residents, basically because a lot of the work would have been done right. But also, we would have trained them well enough that we could get them out to do other things. And then you go in year four, you start back investing in new artists coming in that's helping push the ideas and concepts around the neighborhood in different ways. And uh, but we actually, you know, you know, I always tell people it's always interesting to to know why you want to do a project and why you do not, right? And so we walked away from this project because. Um, because we didn't feel like the uh, that the the group that brought us in were really committed to the level of community engagement that they uh, that they basically commissioned us to do as we kind of uh, went through the process. So this is one of those things that we we 
you know, is still on the burner. Maybe someday it'll pick up again, but we'll see. Now, the last two things I'm going to just show you real quickly is, is, is to just bring it all back, right? That I've shown you, I showed you some large scale uh, projects, and um, and I think that that's important. But in reality, though, all projects, though, to me, you know, it doesn't matter the scale. They start at the at the on the, on the on the scale of the individual. You know, how do we get the individual to buy into the notion of creativity and and um, and uh, uh, yeah, creativity as a way of of, of catalyzing them to become the people that they want, to build the families that they want, to build the neighborhoods that they want, and so on and so forth, right? And so this woman, uh, Asada Richards, was in our Young Mothers program, and uh, she was a very challenged young woman that was on academic probation when she uh, came into our program. And But just to make a, which is a long story, I'll make it short, just saying that she ended up uh, finishing um, our program in two years getting a full scholarship to a PhD program at uh, Penn State, in which she completed uh, in the five years there. Ended up teaching at University of Pittsburgh for three or four years until she decided she wanted to move back to Houston and, and be involved in the community that helped her. Well, when she came back to Houston, she started working with Project Row Houses. We managed to tell her story to the mayor, and the mayor was so excited about it that she ended up appointing her as a commissioner on the housing authority. Uh, board and she's like really has transformed her life in a in an amazing uh, in an amazing kind of way, and then the last one is this guy uh, Eugene Howard, who uh, who calls himself brother-in-law, and he is uh, you know he's a very uh, charming guy had been in prison for you know some twenty something years, and uh, when he got out he you know the neighborhood had changed so he didn't have family he didn't have people around. And uh, somehow he found Project Row Houses and would just come and hang out all the time. And he would always help out doing little things here and there. And um, and so at some point, you know, I started giving him a little money for things that he would do. And every time I did, he would show up with a big plate of barbecue. You know, he was like trying to feed people. And um, and so one day I was sitting and, and talking to him and I thought, you know, I was like, you know, brother-in-law, if you, if you were starting your life over again, you know, what would you what would you imagine yourself as being? You know, what would you like to have done? And um, and we we talked about it, and he said, "Well, you know, I like cooking, so maybe a cafe." And so I had been doing these things where I had been trying to highlight uh, interesting things in the neighborhood that most people overlook, right? And making these posters about them. And so I thought maybe I should do this with brother-in-law. Maybe I should try to like you know make an image of him and try to project him out in the into the neighborhood. And so. We talked about him being a, 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 you know, a cook and all that stuff. And so we came up with this image of him, right? So, so we came up with this image of him, you know, um, uh, you know, because he, you know, he had this great smile and he's very generous and all. And, um, and so he, um, so we put these posters up all over the neighborhood and all of a sudden, you know, people knew who he was, right? And so he was, it, it was a great, uh, uh, you know, Point of self-esteem for him, you know, to, to to be recognized and people talk about him. And then we, we also started to pay him to cook for us at Project Horizons for different events and things. And then it just kind of went from there and it grew a little bit, you know. So it went to the point where, you know, all of a sudden, you know, he was doing events. He had his aprons, he had mugs and caps and all this stuff, and uh, and you know, and just kind of became a little, you know, neighborhood celebrity, right? And um, and so, you know, brother-in-law, brother-in-law died, I think, in 2012, you know, and it was, uh, it was just interesting, though, to watch someone who was, who when I, you know, when, when I met him, you know, he was basically in the same category that people would have thought of the little shotgun houses, right, as having no value, you should just wipe them away, right? Uh, you know, someone like brother-in-law, no value, he should just be in prison somewhere, you know. And all of a sudden, you know, you can kind of recontextualize people and give them a, a new uh, a new set of value, and all of a sudden they become, you know, not only contributors in, for their own life, but even for the community. And uh, and so I think that that's to me the whole essence of the work that I do, and the whole, you know, the 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 foundation that social sculpture stands on is our capacity to actually uh, catalyze, uh, uh, you know, people that see themselves as ordinary or less than ordinary in uh, in bringing out that 
extraordinary quality that everybody has in them somewhere. And so with that, I'll close. Thank you. Well, yeah, that's a that's a that's a good that's a good question, and uh, and it's really an important question in the in the climate that we're in now, and that actually that this kind of work has moved us to, right? is this kind of work has moved us to the point where, you know, people are talking about artists as being you know problem solvers, right, and they want to put us in the category of being the people that can, you know, solve things and make things right. Well, the truth of the matter is, I mean, I think, I don't think that's the role of artists, you know, and I don't think that we can, we, we need to have that put on us, right? I mean, you know, most of the, I mean, it's great if we can do things that actually address problems, but, uh, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a dangerous place to go and you set yourself up for, you know, major disappointments if you're setting out saying that you're, you're an artist that's going to solve a problem. I'll give you an example of this um, uh, there's a writer, a critic in New York, uh, Ben Davis. He wrote um, uh, a review of this new form of art that's now called social practice. Most people call it social practice. And he was criticizing it, uh, basically asking the question of whether artists were, were positioning themselves to be a scapegoat for responsibility of what, you know, the state should be doing, and so on and so forth, right? So, for instance, you know, if you say, you know, if, if we go around and we say, oh, well, well, you know, you know, artists can do youth after-school education, so it means that, you know, you know, the state doesn't have to do it, but we don't have the resources to do it, right? Just recently, I saw in um, in uh, there's an article about the mayor of Los Angeles who the headline of the story was something like, you know, mayors looking for artists to solve the problem of pedestrian deaths on the streets of Los Angeles, right? And so, you know, and it, you know, and in the article it talks about, you know, having the artists, giving the artists a two-year residency, you know, to work with, you know, city officials and all this, you know, and a $20,000 stipend. Now, that's a very cheap solution, you know, if you can get it, right? But so, so the problem with that <coughs> is that, you know, if you if you set yourself out to 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 take it on as like you know your your the weight of it, you know you're solving these problems, and you're probably going to find yourself in a very you know disappointed you know disappointing you know position. And so I always try to mitigate that by saying that you know we're hoping we can solve some problems, but we're hoping, but more than that, we're hoping we can you know shine a light symbolically on things that have meaning and value to people that. Hopefully the people who are responsible, whose jobs it really is to solve the problem, can actually learn from us. Well, you know, I think one of the one of the things that um, that I think I've seen seen changed is that you know it's not a lot of neighborhoods that you can go to like you know low income African American neighborhoods where you can start almost anybody on the street you can start talking to them about installations. You know, I mean, you know, people, you know, it's like it's a it's a it's a part of their life and their language and their understanding, right? And also, you know, the the notion of how how many people, like at one point when we start doing housing, uh, housing, uh, the, the question was, you know, we had this thing that we wanted to make sure that we had artists integrated into the housing. We didn't want to do specifically artist housing, but we wanted artists integrated in. And the, the interesting thing that we started to find out was that so many people um, 
in our community were beginning to reference themselves as artists. And that was a big, you know, and that's a, and to me, that's a big win, right? Because when people can see themselves as artists and they see their, uh, uh, you know, their responsibility to their actions in different ways, that's a huge uh, 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 component of the success, I think. So there was one more question. Yeah, I, I live in the I, I live in the third ward. Yeah, I don't live on Project Rojas's property, but I live you know a few blocks away. And uh, but one of, but one of the key things about doing the work though is to make sure that I, I find this to be really important um, is is being accessible and being there and you know spending time. So you know when I'm in Houston, I mean one of the things I, I you know, we have an open door policy and we have a domino table. I'm always playing dominoes. People always know where to find me because that's, a, you know, that's a big part of, you know, uh, connecting with people and letting them know that they're, that, 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 um, uh, that they have access, you know, to, you know, to the people that are leading or doing things in their community. And that's why I think translation is really actually in such a wonderful spot right now is because Carol is there with people. You know, she's, she's spending that time there and building uh, a deeper level of trust than than I could actually do as someone who's you know coming in and out from time to time. So. Okay. All right. So Thank you. Thank you.